Johnny presents The Philip Morris Playhouse Produced, edited, and directed by William Spear Tonight's star, Vincent Price It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling to wake up fresh with no cigarette hangover. Yes, you'll be glad tomorrow you smoke Philip Morris today. Call for Philip Morris. And now, with Vincent Price as star, we bring you Leona's Room. Tonight's production in the Philip Morris Playhouse. <laughs> Leona was laughing. For me, there was no joy in it anymore. Her room had suddenly become exactly what it was. Two flights up and walk back, a cubicle in a cheap rooming house. Four sides of naked plaster with a single electric light bulb strung from the ceiling and the frayed rug. The furniture with a patched upholstery and the rust-stained basin in the corner. And Leona. Leona with a drink in her hand. The room was a fine backdrop for Leona. Oh, come on, honey. Drink your drink. You want Leona to fresh it up for you. Forget it. Oh, honey. Oh. Come on, make Leona laugh some more. That's why we're here, isn't it? For last? Just for that. For a big time, the two of us. Yeah. Me and Leona, whatever your last name is, and let the rest of the world go by. <laughs> I'm funny, huh? I'm a funny man. Oh, I should have met you a long time ago instead of just tonight. Leona gets a big reaction from you, honey. You got your last one, kid. I'm leaving. Just like that. Leave. Leona remembers when you liked her, honey. Leona remembers when you That was said... two hours ago. You looked a lot better then. Oh, that's great. That's the greatest one yet. The great Philip Dane and How do you know my name? Know your name, honey. Oh, you picture in the paper every day over that lousy scandal column that you write. You with your famous white carnation in your lapel. Sure, honey. I knew who you were all the time. Yeah. So go dream your dream about how once Philip Dane was nice to you. Right now, that's all. Wait. Wait a minute. Don't go yet. Get out of my way. Come on. Tell Leona you're sorry for what you said. I like you, honey. Look, I've got no more time to play with you. Now let me out Give of this. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss, Phil. You'll see. Leona isn't what you said. I said get out of my way. Phil. That's what you are, Mr. Dane. You're filth. A two-bit cheapster. Thinks he gives a girl a moon with a smile and a couple of drinks. You write poison about other people and sneak up the side streets to have your... <laughs> sure. Sure, hit me. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you and me. We're an item, aren't we? Both of us. Phil. <laughs> For a second, I stared where she had fallen. Motionless, her face all at once like scraped bone. I turned to go, but the afterimage of a lot of other faces stopped me. On my beat, I had seen a lot of dead faces, and hers matched. Her head lay against the lead piping of the wash basin. I watched a small red pearl squeeze through her lips, and then it died, too. Fingerprints. I touched two things in that room, Leona and the highball glass. I smashed it on the floor and ground it with my heel. Now there was no possible connection between Leona and me. I had met her alone only two hours ago. Sometime soon the police would look at her and write out a tag that said, Dead on Arrival. Maybe they would even find out what Leona's last name was. When I got outside, it was raining. That was a break because the rain had washed away the human rubbish that always littered that neighborhood and there was no one to see me leave the house. The color bled out of the neon signs and smeared across the wet pavements and I started walking. 
I remembered somewhere in this part of town there was a five-a-day vaudeville house that had hung on through the years like a broken-down acrobat left stranded on a high trapeze. <laughs> I'd meant to cover it many times in my column for laughs. I figured tonight was as good as any. The gaiety. It looked real happy. I bought a ticket, went inside, and found a seat. I looked around at the audience, what there was of it. Farmers and juvenile delinquents was what I'd call them in the column. The billing card slipped into place for the next act. Malbrino and Maya, it said. The curtain went up. Malbrino stood with his back to the audience, his arms reaching out for Maya. I bent forward. She was something. Her eyes were enormous and gray and deep enough to drown. There are those among you who will disbelieve what you are about to witness. I say to you only, wait. I will descend among you and walk down the aisle. And here I choose a gentleman and ask him for some small object whose description is known only to himself. Do you have such an object, sir? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got a good one. Here, thank you. Yeah, they'll never get it. Maya! I listen, Malbrino. What is it that I hold in my hand? It is... It is something that has come from far away. It is an envelope postmarked Paris, France. Correct! An envelope postmarked Paris, France. Maya! Yes, Malbrino? Thank you, madame. Reach into the spaces beyond space and tell me... What is this precious thing I hold in my hand? It is a locket. And inside there is a strand of golden hair. A child. Yes! Okay. Yes, it's my little boy. Isn't that wonderful? Well, here's the thing, gentlemen, has given to me. Malbrino! Do not lose your concentration, Maya. Identify this object. Malbrino! You must! You must! There is darkness here. Only darkness. He stands in the way. He stands in the way. Maya! There is a murderer here. Huh? A murderer! <laughs> they rang down the curtain and I sat there. I glanced around at my fellow spectators. Some of the audience was laughing. Obviously, these were people who had written the thing off as a dramatic trick. But others were obviously affected by it. And I... <laughs> you'll laugh. You'll say this was naive, superstitious, ridiculous. But I had to find out. I had to make sure. I waited until the house began to give attention to a song and dance act. There was a door to the left of the orchestra pit that led backstage. I slipped out of my seat and headed for it, as if it were my business. I walked down a corridor. There were cells on each side tagged with the performers' names. Maya's door had a star on it. The star was gilt, and it was peeling. A moment. Yes? She was taller than I had thought, and slender. Her face was delicate with an almost wistful expression. But it was her eyes, gray and soft, as if the color had been strained through gauze. Yes? What is it? I came back to congratulate you on your performance, Maya. That's quite an act, big time. Thank you. But it is not an act. No? <laughs> You're good, Maya. Very good. Why haven't I seen this act that isn't an act before? Malbrino and Maya are from Europe. It is the first time we have been in this country. How long have you been here? Tonight was our first performance. It did not end as we had planned. It couldn't have looked more rehearsed. Believe what you like. Now, please excuse me. I am quite exhausted. Don't run out on me. It makes me write bad notices. Write what you like. It cannot concern Maya. Why did you say there was a murderer in the theater? I do not know why I say things. My lips speak the words that truth shapes for them. There was a murderer. I felt his presence. Do you still feel it? Yes. Maya, taxi cab is waiting to take us to the hotel. This, oh. this is a newspaper man, Malbrino. Oh, it's always a delight to meet a fellow professional. Wait for me in the taxi, Maya. I'll be only a moment. 
You saw the extraordinary performance, Mr. Dane, Philip Dane. Ah, oh, Philip Dane. Yeah. Your column is known even in Europe. I'm overcome, Mr. Dane. It's an honor that you should be a convert of my uh, miraculous powers. Now, Malbrino, we don't have to kid each other, do we? We uh, fellow professionals? No. But others are perhaps not so perceptive as you. It is amusing to kid them. Also, one lives in this way. Then that uh, murderer bit was phony. Let us say, an act such as ours needs one piece of sensationalism to shock a new audience. I think we have it. Do you agree? You bought yourself a paragraph, Malvina. I like your style. I'm delighted and grateful. Tell Maya something for yes, me. Yes, Mr. Dane. Tell her her eyes are the most beautiful eyes I have ever seen. She would be pleased, for she is blind. I dropped in to catch Gypsy Rose Lee's late show at the Martinique. On the way back to my apartment, I picked up the early edition of the news. There was a five-line story spliced between the financial column and court arrivals. The police had answered a call from a nervous landlady. Leona Michaels was dead. Her body had been turned over to the coroner. That was all. That was all there was ever going to be. I took a pill and got to sleep. I woke a couple of times hearing noises. Towards morning, I had a nightmare. I was standing in a big stone yard, and I was watching some men, some blind men, building a scaffold. They were hammering. And then I was awake. I jumped out of bed. Then I saw what the hammering had been. Nailed to my door, a shroud for a dead man nailed to my door with a funeral wreath of white carnations and pinned to one corner of the wreath a small white envelope. I pulled it down and opened it. I read the black-rimmed card inside. In memory of Philip Dane, it said, Thou art cursed because thou hast killed. You've heard Act One of Leona's Room, starring Vincent Price. In this brief intermission for a smoke in the Philip Morris Playhouse, here is Mr. John Holbrook with some important facts well worth remembering, well worth acting on. Over two million more smokers have switched to Philip Morris. Yes, over two million more smokers are now enjoying in Philip Morris a milder smoke, a cleaner, fresher smoke than they've ever known before. If you're tired of cigarette hangover, that stale, musty, smoked-out taste in your mouth, join the millions and switch to Philip Morris. If you're tired of cigarette hangover, that tight, dry feeling in your throat, join the millions and switch to Philip Morris. Remember, Philip Morris is the one, the only cigarette, proved definitely less irritating, definitely milder than any other leading brand. No other cigarette can make that statement. Remember, eminent doctors, top-ranking nose and throat specialists, actually suggest Philip Morris in cases of irritation due to smoking. And above all, remember this. You'll be glad tomorrow you smoke Philip Morris today. Now, Vincent Price in Act Two of Leona's Room. Tonight's production in the Philip Morris Playhouse. Something for you, sir? Yeah. Just this morning, sir. Just arrived. Uh, some fresh-cut camellias? No flowers, a shroud. Talk to me about that. Oh, my condolences, sir, of course. If you'll come this way. A shroud that was delivered to 1256 Park Boulevard, Apartment 3, this morning from your shop. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember such an order. I hope it met with your requirements. I'm crazy about it. Why was it nailed on my door? Why? I don't understand. I didn't order it. Who did? Why... Early this morning, sir. Uh, early this morning, there was a special delivery letter. In it was an order for a shroud and a wreath with, uh, with instructions as to their disposition. Yeah, but who? Who wrote the order? Who gave the instructions? Oh, I don't really know, sir. The, the note was typewritten, unsigned. Uh, I thought someone who desired to remain anonymous... Tell your boy to tear that thing off my door. Oh, uh, but, sir... 
It was too early in the day to drink, but I found myself at the Chatham Bar. If I expected to find an answer in the bottom of a shot glass, it wasn't there. It wasn't anywhere I could think of. Nobody could have known I was in Leona's room. Nobody. I told myself that, and I felt better. I went back to my apartment for the thousand little details a columnist has to do, the phone calls, the letters, the... Someone was waiting in front of my door. I took the liberty. I knew you wanted to see me. Who are you? Here. Take one. My card. That's all right. I can see from right here it's real pretty. What does it say on it? John Quitty, Lily Pardon Cemetery. I see. Now tell me. It was a newspaper man asked you to come around and see me, wasn't it? You know, we at Lily Pond like to think... Never mind that. What do you want? In this hour of your greatest need, we of Lily Pond are... Are you going to tell me what you want or do I have to beat it out of you? Why, why, sir, uh, I am here to make the final arrangement for the funeral. Funeral? What funeral? Nobody's dead. Nobody's even feeling bad. Look... Now, look, see, I, I live here. I live all by myself. I feel great. I never felt better. Sir, I, I'm confused about the casket. Look, it's a joke, a gag, something the boys cooked up. That's it, isn't it? That's it, isn't it? Talk to me. Please. Who sent you here? Uh, a, a letter. A, a letter th this morning with money and instructions. Typewritten, no signature. Th that's right. It, it said to come to this address and, and make arrangements to receive the body. Who's? Whose body? The, the letters said the body of Philip Dane. It said Philip Dane was about to die. It said he was going to be executed for murder. All of a sudden, there were no more words. His jaws were moving, but there was no sound. He was out of focus, bleary. I ran past him and out into the street. The cab took ten minutes to get me to Leona's rooming house. If someone in that house recognized me as a murderer, I would know it no matter how he tried to hide it. I would know it. Face him and take it from there. That was the... Yeah, what is it? Well? Have you ever seen me before? What? I mean it. Have you ever seen me before? Have I ever been here before? Seen you? How do I know if I ever seen you? You're wearing a necktie, ain't you? And you got a shave? That makes it ten to one against. <laughs> and a carnation yet. That makes it a hundred. Please, please. It's just that I have a feeling that I've been here before. I've got to find out. Hey. Hey, are you sick? It happens like this lots of times. Amnesia, you know, the war. You, you sure you've never seen me? Who knows, running this flea bag. They sign the register and they pay in advance. Hey, wait a minute. Heim! Heim, come here! Who's that? That's my husband. He snoops and he's got a memory. Uh, you calling me? Yeah, 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 yeah. What'd you say you had, mister? Amnesia. You got amnesia? Yeah, it's interesting, real interesting. The gentleman wants to know if you ever saw him before. Says he's got to know. Ah, uh, ah, uh, no, 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 never did. How about your other guests? Could I see them? Well, now I tell you, one of the rumors is sleeping off a three-day drunk, and it'll take him three days to sleep it off. Another one I ain't seen for a week, and the third one's in a morgue. Moved there this morning, dead. That Leona yeah. always... It's a gag, then. Gag? What's a gag? <laughs> never mind. Thanks, Lee. All right, all right. Yeah? Hello, Mr. Dane. Mr. Philip Dane? Yeah. Mabrino speaking. Mabrino? Yes. Will you do me the honor to meet me at 11.30 tonight in the park? This war will be charming. Charm me over the phone, Malbrino. I don't like the cold night air. It can be so helpful. Bring money with you. Say, $5,000 for this first time. And come alone. Have you gone crazy, Malbrino? The murderer does not question another's sanity. To him, all other beings are insane. This is not so. How would I know about murderers? Ask Leona Michaels. Mm. Leona? How did you find out about her? You told me when you were so curious about a murder after the performance. You told me when you permitted the grisly humors of the shroud and casket to force you to revisit the scene of death. You've been following me. Of course. Each of your flights of terror became more promising. When you entered the rooming house, I made inquiries. They told me of the lonely girl who had been murdered. That was nice of them. Wasn't it? I can expect you then at 11.30, Mr. Dane. That will give me time to change after my performance. Sure. Sure. 11.30. I'll be glad to do you the honor, Malbrino. Now it was easier. Now I knew what to be afraid of. 
Malbrino, the clever Malbrino, whose wife Maya had pale, lovely, blind eyes. What an act they had. I wondered how many times their sensational finish had paid off like this. There's a murderer in this theater. And maybe he'll come backstage after the show and visit us. Huh? Your ticket. Oh. They got a rule here. Everybody shows me a ticket. Oh, the ticket, yeah, here. Uh huh. That's one aisle over, tenth row. You won't have no trouble finding it. You can hunt deer in here tonight. Gosh, it wasn't kidding. There weren't 30 people in the house at the gaiety. The opening act was on a family of Armenian jugglers whirling shiny hoops on every <laughs> loose piece of anatomy on the stage. Malbrino and Maya were next to closing, so I figured I had about an hour. I waited until the Armenians were balancing everything but the proscenium. And just as they were taking their bows, I used the same orchestra entrance to backstage. The door to Maya's dressing room was open, and the room was dark. I eased inside just as the next act came hurrying down the corridor, still hooking up their costumes. I brushed against a moldy curtain hung from wooden rings. I pulled it back and hid behind it. And I waited. Still, I cannot understand why you must leave me tonight, Malbrino. What is so important at 11.30? Through the dim light of the corridor, I saw Maya walk into the room and sit at her dressing table. Malbrino was behind her. He was reaching for the light switch when my hands found his mouth and throat and began to strangle him. My fingers dug into his flesh. I crushed his breath back into his insides and he made no sound. It was only the soft laughter that seeped through the theater and his soft throat in my hands and then Maya's soft voice. Why do you not answer, Malbrino? Is it a rendezvous? Malbrino? Malbrino, what is it? What is so silent? Malbrino? Malbrino! Suddenly her fingers were on my face, furtive and quick as the wings of a frightened bird. Then slowly they began to search the empty air for the dead Malbrino. She turned and her blind eyes stared at me. I threw her aside and ran down the corridor. An old doorman was reading a newspaper at the stage door. I couldn't get out that way without his seeing me. There was only one way back. Back through the theater. That's okay, lady. Why'd you have to hit me across the face with a dead fish? I started up the aisle. Then I knew I was doing the wrong thing. There was an usher at the head of it in this tiny audience. If I left in the middle of an act, he would remember me. So I sat down in the row that was most filled. When I looked back, act after the next act, there were... Men in overcoats standing at each exit. And then the curtain rose and Maya stood there with a man I had never seen before. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I shall descend among you, accompanied by this gentleman, and read your minds through my fingertips. You, sir... I can read your innermost secrets by touching your face. So, sir, you told your wife you were working late at the office tonight. Oh. <laughs> and, and you, sir, my fingers reveal that you came here on a pass. <laughs> please, please. And now, there is a gentleman in this row wearing a carnation. I... Hey, don't throw it away. What's the matter, Budge? Afraid my I'll give away your secret? Take your hands off of me. Oh, go on. Oh, Cooperate. Oh, One side. Let go. Let me... Hey, get this guy, Joe. He's got secrets. You got secrets, mister? Hey, Maya, there's a guy who's got secrets. Shut up. Shut up, you no, fool. Hurry up, Maya. Oh, oh, <laughs> They held me there laughing. The others turned in their seats to stare. The man with Maya took her arm and led her to me. Her fingers reached out, 
trailed across my face, they were cool and gentle, almost a kiss. This is the man. This is a murderer. Tonight, the Philip Morris Playhouse presented Leona's Room, produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Our star, Vincent Price, will be back in a moment for a curtain call. In the meantime... Watch out. Watch out. Watch out for... Cigarette hangover. That stale, musty, smoked-out taste in your mouth. Cigarette hangover. That tight, dry, uncomfortable feeling in your throat. Cigarette hangover. That's what takes the joy out of smoking. And when that happens to you, it's time to switch to Philip Morris. Remember, over two million more smokers have switched to Philip Morris. Yes, if you're tired of cigarette hangover, join the millions who have discovered in Philip Morris a milder smoke, a cleaner, fresher smoke than they've ever known before. Over two million more smokers have switched to Philip Morris. Remember, Philip Morris is the one, the only cigarette, proved definitely less irritating, proved definitely milder than any other leading brand. No other cigarette can make that statement. Remember, top-ranking doctors, eminent nose and throat specialists, actually suggest Philip Morris in cases of irritation due to smoking. Above all, remember this. You'll be glad tomorrow you smoke Philip Morris today. You know, Johnny, it's amazing to me how our hero tonight had time to write his column, what with all his extracurricular activities. And speaking of heroes, I understand Academy Award contender Dan Daly is to be your star next week. That's right, Mr. Price, and we've informed Mr. Daly by special messenger that there will be no dancing come next Friday. He's to be the villain in the piece. That sounds intriguing. Before you go, Mr. Price, may I present you with this carton of Philip Morris cigarettes. And thank you for an exciting performance. Thank you, Johnny. Good night, Mr. Price. This is Johnny again reminding you, if you're tired of cigarette hangover, call for the one cigarette that gives you a milder, fresher, cleaner smoke. Yes, call for Philip Morris! And now, goodbye, Johnny. See you next Friday, same time, same station, when once again we will present the Philip Morris Playhouse, starring Dan Daly. Until then... Mmm, what a smooth smoke. Revelation pipe tobacco. Mmm, so even burning. Revelation pipe tobacco. Five great tobaccos blended for smoothness, mildness, and flavor. Cut five different ways for even burning pleasure. Revelation pipe tobacco. Fifteen cents for the pocket pack. Try some. Vincent Price appeared through the courtesy of Universal International Studios, now releasing Family Honeymoon, starring Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray. Tonight's original radio play was by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Music on the Philip Morris Playhouse is under the direction of Lud Gluskin. All names and characters used on this program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Art Ballinger saying goodnight for Philip Morris. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.